Um, hi, everybody. My name's Dan. Uh, and yes, I live in Northern California. I'm in Santa Rosa, which is about one hour north of San Francisco. Um, just a little bit about my background and climate change, you know, always having heard about it, um, kind of in the news, um, you know, a slight level of concern. But then when the fires started hitting real heavily here in California, it, it really hit home. Um, and Santa Rosa and Sonoma County was heavily affected starting about four years ago. And now it's just kind of an annual thing. So, um, so everybody's trying to do what they can. And um, yeah, uh, so as a math teacher, I asked myself like, well, what can I do to try and, you know, talk to my students about climate change and really bring it to the forefront. So um, what I'm going to do is share my screen and basically show you how I have been uh, incorporating uh, um, climate change, just little tidbits of information into my lesson plans in the form of word problems or like applications of, um, of, of just of the, the topic we might be learning at any particular time. So, so just to get more specific, I teach Algebra 1 Geometry and Calculus. Um, I'm, I'm at a high school level here. And um, I just, uh, for the, the final project for the Climate Action Academy, I made just six examples of word problems or applications that one might use in these three classes. So I'll go through with them. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the weeds, but um, I'm happy to troubleshoot with anybody later if you want to talk more. Um, so for Algebra 1, one of the examples was uh, there's a carbon footprint calculator that, that we get uh, pointed to in the uh, Climate Action Academy. And one thing it tells you is it tells you how many Earths your lifestyle would uh, take uh, to how many Earths it would take to like to sustain your lifestyle, right? So you might get something like, you know, 2.3 Earths or something like that to tell you how many, you know, how many Earths it would take to sustain your lifestyle. And it also tells you how many global hectares uh, that translates to. Right. So I don't know, maybe it's like 150 hectares or something like that. But then, you know, it begs the question is like, well, how many earths would it take or how many hectares would it take to live on one earth? But it, it doesn't really answer this. So so this is a perfect proportion problem where, you know, you have one number to uh, 2.3 to one earth and then is equal to 150 to X. And then you can go ahead and solve this. Um, so this is one of the uh, algebra one examples. Again, this is getting a little bit into the weeds, so I apologize if this is uh, bringing up old math stuff that people are, you know, kind of not, not super, um, you know, it's a little rusty maybe. But um, this one's really good as well. Uh, this is another Algebra 1 one, and this is uh, some statistics taken from this article that Bill McKibben wrote. Um, it's called The Terrifying New Math. And it's from an article he wrote in the Rolling Stones in 2012. And basically, it's a little blurry here, but basically said in uh, the, climate, the Paris Climate um, Accord, they, they said that we need to keep below two degrees Celsius, right? Um, and they also said that the amount of carbon that we are allowed to burn uh, to keep below this two degrees Celsius is about 565 gigatons of carbon in the, in the form of coal or gas or oil. Um, but it also says that the uh, fossil fuel industry has about 2,795 gigatons worth of carbon in its reserves. Even if it hasn't used them, it has this much capacity. And so what you might do in your Algebra 1 class is uh, draw some, some inequalities with this. And, um, you know, so we need to keep things less than or equal to 2 degrees Celsius and that means burning less than or equal to 565 gigatons of carbon, but the fossil fuel industry has 2,795 gigatons. So not only are you hitting the lesson that you're trying to achieve, but, but it, it, it brings home to the students the, the situation at hand. Um, I will keep going. So those are some Algebra 1 applications. Um, uh, a quick geometry one, I won't go too into this too much, but... Um, this one is more about, uh, in geometry, you might have to, one of the topics at our school we teach is we, they have to find the area of sectors of a circle. So it's kind of like a pizza slice of a circle. And then we talk about diets, right? Like how much of your diet is vegetables and how much of it is processed foods and other things like that. And so basically we're gonna talk about the standard American diet versus what the USDA, the United States, um, 
uh, you know, uh, suggests what uh, a standard diet is, but then we talk about more what a climate friendly diet would be. And basically it's, you know, increasing this uh, sector of, of the vegetables on your plate, right? So, so trying to hit this idea of eating for climate change um, and tying it into geometry. Um, the last couple uh, ideas here is that is, uh, are more calculus based. So um, one of them is just simply to get vocabulary across with regard to calculus. And one of those things is that um, we, we need to learn words like uh, inflection points and critical points and concavity. And so basically this graph right here is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over time. And so what is happening right at the moment is that the amount of carbon dioxide is going up, but not only is it going up, but it's going up at an increasing rate. And so we can talk about that as being concave up and we need to basically hit an inflection point where it's maybe still going up, but the rate at which it's going up, it's starting to slow down until we hit a critical point, which is the peak and then it would start to drop. So this is a hopeful scenario that, um, that we, we hope to achieve, but it, but it also gives across this calculus uh, vocabulary that, that we would need to, to teach. Um, and just a couple other ones. Uh, again, I'm talking about this idea of how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere over time. This is, this is a graph of that all the way back to the 1800s until the present. Um, and you can find the average rate of change of how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere by finding the slope of this line that goes through these two points. Um, and, and we find that the slope tends to be about 1.6 parts per million of carbon dioxide per year. Um, so this is real easy and this is about average rates of change. Um, and then the last one, and this is, this is definitely my favorite and I'm just gonna kind of like unabashedly just nerd out on this. I, I really like this one. Um, this third application is this, um, it's, it's again, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over time. And um, this right here is the Keeling curve, right? So it's, it's the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over time that this, this scientist, Dr. Keeling found, uh, or he recorded over time. And you can model this information with an equation, right? Um, and you can also have a great discussion about how, how it's sinusoidal in nature, over the seasons, but it's also going up kind of like a parabola, like it's quadratic in general. So you can graph this with this like gnarly looking equation over here, right? And what you can do with this though, is you could simplify this equation. This one takes into account all the little variations going up and down and up and down. But then over to, if you wanna simplify it, this is just the quadratic piece, piece right here. And it just talks about it going up and up and up. And if you do that, then you can take the derivative of this function at certain points in time and find the instantaneous rate of change or basically how fast it's going up at any moment in time where these are years um, after a certain time period, which I think was like 1982. So this would be 1982 right here. This would be in 2020 and this would be in 2050. And these tell you how fast the carbon dioxide is going up by taking the derivative of this function. So. Okay, unbelievably nerdy, and I know that uh, I should probably stop, but if you ever wanna get more into the weeds with this, I like love talking about it. I'm gonna put my email in the chat. And um, yeah, so just in general, infusing the math curriculum with examples like this. And the last thing I'll just say is that it's really important, I think, to not only teach this stuff, but after, to sh after showing this kind of like pretty heavy information to give students opportunities for what they can do to take action. Cause like I already presented some of these and some of the students were like, oh my gosh, like I'm gonna go home and like cry. But I'm like, no, now you should go join the club we have at school or you should go join this thing in the city that's, you know, um, you know taking action in this way. So, so giving opportunities along with the, uh, along with the information. But okay, so thank you.